Okay, first I just wanted to say hi, tell you that I used to work for Gallaudet University for around 12 years. <laughs> I've been involved in disability access issues policy on the policy level for the last 30 plus years. I'm not going to give away my age, I'm going to stop at that. But I'm thrilled to be here, a little bit daunted because all of you are experts on engineering and technology, and I'm not, I'm not, I'm policy only. So please be kind to me, be um, gentle, <laughs> gentle, nice, kind. I'm, I, my signing is not as perfect as it should be. Um, anyway, but I'm going to use the interpreter going forward. We'll be moving a lot faster if we do that. So thank you. <laughs> And I'm, like I said, I'm thrilled to be here. Okay, so um, uh, I, it was really interesting for me to hear Ian's introduction um, because I want you to take away, if you take away anything from this conference, take away at least three concepts. And this was not part of my presentation, but I really wanted to pick up on what Ian said. First of all, the societal benefit. Um, you know, a lot of times people think gaming, they think it's just fun and games. That's the same thing that we heard years ago when we worked on legislation to require captioning on television. If you don't have access to the culture, if, you don't have, if you're not part of the um, part of what is uh, so mainstream in society, you're cut out. And it was interesting to me. I was watching Good Morning America a couple of weeks ago, and I heard a person named Dr. Jonathan Fader, a clinical sports psychologist, talk about Fortnite. And this is actually going to connect to the CVAA because what he said, the CVAA, let me just say that the CVAA is, is not a law about gaming. I think you know that. It's a law about communications access, advanced communications access and video programming. So it's being able to communicate with each other. When we were writing the CVAA, we had no idea that this was going to have an impact, a side impact or tangential impact on other things, including e-readers and gaming. We have been thrilled that it has had that impact. But one of the things that you should know, and right off the bat, is that the CVAA does not require accessible gaming. It requires accessible communications in gaming. What I loved about this comment by this, this Dr. Fader is he said about Fortnite, it's a multiplayer game. The thing that teenagers really enjoy about it is that you're actually talking to your friends while you're doing it. So that's one of the fun parts about it. It's that interactive component. A lot of kids who aren't connected in sports or other settings really find a social scene in that, which is a benefit. That goes to my heart. I mean, that is incredible. For kids that don't have another way of having social interaction, doing it through games is extraordinary. And that's where the CBA comes in. Then there was another individual, Scott Steinberg, a trends expert. I'm not sure how you get that name. Um, but what he said is for some parents, social, the social aspect may eventually actually have a positive effect. And that's directed to all the parents like me who had three boys who lived with video games and you're wondering what this social benefit is. Well, there it is. The beauty of video games is that they're, they're moving from being solo experiences to more social experiences that invite people to come together and bond over a shared positive activity. So that's the first one, that societal benefit, critical. The second is retrofitting, and I saw this on one of the quotes outside, retrofitting is so much more expensive than designing with access. And because of customization, which you also touched on, and the ability of software to transform um, really any technology, uh, now there is nothing is impossible. Nothing, I mean, my, my view is that it, over the years, I, again, I started in this industry when everything was hardware. Now everything is basically, in my opinion, most likely pretty achievable, which is the standard under the CVAA. Of course, there are going to be some exceptions, but that's kind of the rule of thumb. And then the third thing that I want you to take away is don't do it on your own if you're a developer, consult with people with disabilities. I can say that 10 times in a row. I have seen that over and over and again backfire. Um, in the, um, when the ADA, I, I, I was very fortunate in working on a lot of the p legislation that, that was mentioned earlier, the ADA, I, I worked on the closed captioning bills, I worked on hearing incompatibility. My favorite story, my least favorite story actually it should be, is when theaters went ahead and installed assistive listening devices after the ADA was adopted and nobody could use them because they hadn't consulted with anybody. And it was so embarrassing for them to have spent thousands if not millions of dollars retrofitting their theaters and they couldn't work. So 
Having said that, let me move on. I know that I have limited time and I have a ton to get through. So let me move on and just tell you about what the CVAA is. Okay, wait, what am I doing wrong? Okay, here we go. Um, okay, so the CVAA is the 21st Century Communications and Video Accessibility Act. It was designed to fill in gaps that, were, that existed before it was adopted. Um, so it's not only requiring communication, it also requires video description, internet captioning on television programs that had not been captioned. Um, and it was obviously designed to address all the new challenges. Many of us, I, as I said, I got started in this field um, in the 1980s. We thought we were gonna be done at the turn of the century. And then all of a sudden this thing called the internet and the World Wide Web got developed and it was like, oh damn it, I can't go retire <laughs> in the Bahamas just yet. Now I've got to work on this new legislation um, or these, these new technologies. And so this, we had adopted, you know, we had gotten past all these laws on making telecommunications the way we used to think about the telephone and closed captioning on TV and like I said, hearing compatibility. We had great laws on all of this in the 80s and the 90s. Well, they all didn't apply to the internet. And so we went back to Congress and we started a, an organization or a coalition called the Coalition of Organizations for Accessible Technology. How many of you have ever heard of COAT? Just a few of you. Okay, COAT was a short-lived organization, a coalition. We formed it to get the CVAA passed. And literally with lightning speed, we went from 10 organizations to 300 across the country we realized we had hit a nerve and that the access that we had gained in all of these other earlier laws, accessibility laws, was slowly starting to seep away and we needed a new law to get, a, to get that um, access uh, in perpetuity. So um, it f covers digital, internet-based and wireless technologies and we at the FCC, I joined the FCC in 2010, right as it was being passed, and I was lucky enough to get a position that enabled me to help implement it with about 100 people at the FCC. I, I've never seen any agency spend as much time as we did on this law, and we've adopted around 25 rules uh, affecting it. So what is the CVAA? The CVAA is divided into two parts. The first part is communications. I mentioned that. What is advanced communications? I'm going to get to that in a second. It also covers web browsers on mobile phones, 911 services. We have a program also to give out free equipment to low income people who are deaf blind. I'm going to just have to apologize. I'm sorry for the interpreter. I'm speaking so fast. So just cut me off if you, if you need to at any point. I'm just trying to get through so much. Um, and uh, the second part of the CVAA is video programming. Uh, it covers, I said, closed captioning of television programming on the internet, making sure that emergency information on TV is accessible. It also requires um, any kind of device, laptops, cell phones, you name it, to have the capability of passing through closed captioning, video description, and accessible emergency information. And it requires accessible controls on televisions and on-screen menus. So if you go home, if you're not familiar with what the CVAA does, if you happen to be sighted, close your eyes and try to control anything on your TV, whether it's on the on-off switch, the volume, uh, picking a program, changing a channel, recording a program, none of that was accessible before the CVAA. And the reason I mention all of this is because all of these other requirements of the CVAA have, have, have resulted in more of an industry of accessibility engineering. And that industry has application to gaming as well because so many advances have been made. So I mentioned advanced communication services. There's four components to advanced communication services. Interconnected VoIP um, and non-interconnected VoIP service, both. Uh, electronic messaging, including uh, anything really in text, such as email, instant messaging, and SMS. There's also another component of video conferencing. That's, that particular component has not gone into effect yet because it only covers interoperable video conferencing and there is that is not typical. Usually in, uh, video conferencing like FaceTime is not interoperable with Skype, is not interoperable with other types of video conferencing. So that's kind of on hold at the FCC right now. So video games. Um, 
so as I mentioned, the CBA does not require accessible gaming, but it does say that people have to be able to communicate with each other by voice or text. Well, it doesn't specify voice or text, it just says communicate. And if that is the case, then it's covered by the CBAA. Um, it will include gaming on mobile devices, gaming on PCs, on consoles, etc. What are the accessibility obligations? Both ACS providers and manufacturers have to make their services and products accessible to people with disabilities, and they also have to be usable unless doing so is not achievable. And that's a key term. Again, I think that at this point in our, t in our industry, in our environment, a lot is achievable, but there may be some things that are not. You can also achieve accessibility by using a third-party solution. And that could be, um, must be available to consumers at non nominal costs. And um, it has to be something, of course, that the consumer can access. What we have found in the communications arena, in the area of cell phones, is that the companies like Samsung and Apple and Microsoft, they are not charging anybody. And, and frankly, I think it's not appropriate to charge anybody for access. This was a compromise that we got on in, in Congress, but I'm very pleased to see that there have, no been any, there have not been any external nominal charges. Um, so what does achievability mean? When you look at whether something is achievable, you're looking at about four factors. The nature and cost of the steps needed to achieve accessibility or compatibility, because compatibility is another option, um, making it compatible, for example, with a Braille device. You're looking at the technical and economic impact on the operation of the manufacturer or provider, as well as on the operation of the specific equipment or service in question, including on the development and deployment of communications technologies. What does that mean? Well, one of the things that we look at is whether it would fundamentally alter the nature of a product or service. Um, again, that hasn't seemed to impede any accessibility. It used to. It, before the CVAA was adopted, there was another law called Section 255 of the Communications Act that recovered telecommunications access. And at that time, when that law was passed in 1996, there were really just hardwired and hard phone, hard, hard, um, hardware phones. And to, again, to retrofit those um, or to retrofit any kind of communication device was sometimes it sometimes required a fundamental alteration. But with software and customization, that's much less likely to happen now. You, we also, the third factor is looking at the types of the operations of the manufacturer or provider. And finally, the extent to which the provider or, service or manufacturer offers accessible services or, equi or equipment containing varying degrees of functionality and features offered at different price points. What that basically means, it usually applies in cell phones. So if there's a whole a product line of cell phones, and uh, there's a ver there are several phones within that product line that are accessible at different price points with different features and functions, you may be able to satisfy the requirements of the CBA. I think that's going to be harder to meet with gaming when every game is, is a little bit different from each other. So how to design for accessibility. I just have three short slides here. Um, obviously, the, you're going to be discussing this extensively during this conference. But one of the things, as I said, that you have to remember is to consider accessibility at the design stage as early as possible. That's going to be when it's less burden, least burdensome, least costly, and most effective. The example I like to give is telecommunications relay services, which many of you are probably familiar with, a national, nationwide program that enables people who are deaf and hard of hearing and who have speech disabilities to communicate through communications assistance by text or sign where the communications assistant either speaks or signs what the individual is typing or signing and then signs or, or texts back. That program now costs $1.3 billion annually. That to me is the epitome of a retrofitted program and it's not as effective as direct communication. In fact, some of us are moving towards trying to convince companies to hire people who know ASL to communicate directly with people like in customer service centers. But it's, to me, it's the, it's the epitome of a retrofit that is expensive, costly, 
um, and uh, not as effective. Um, so the FCC rules also establish performance objectives. There are a, a, there's a long laundry list of performance objectives. So I'm going to talk to you about some of these. These are not inclusive, but they cover the majority. The input, control, and mechanical functions must be locatable, identifiable, and operable, and have at least one mode, and this is the uh, slide, as you can see, for people who are blind or visually impaired, one mode that allows use without vision, with low vision, or limited or no hearing. In other words, if you're deaf and blind, or have some level of hearing loss, and with little or no color perception. There are other performance objectives for people who are deaf or hard of hearing. Similarly, you have to have at least one mode that doesn't require user auditory perception. You must provide auditory information through at least one mode in visual form and where appropriate in tactile form. You must provide audio or acoustic information including any auditory feedback tones important to the use of the product through increased amplification, increased signal to noise ratio, or a common combination. You must reduce interference to hearing aids, cochlear implants, and other hearing assistive technologies. That usually applies more to cell phones, but I added it in. It's, that's, that's the hearing aid requirement. I added it in just because we're moving to a lot, we, there's a lot of wireless games, so you should just know about it. And again, if it's wireless um, and using IP, it has to pro provide compatibility with TTY devices or real-time text capability. Again, this is mostly with respect to cell phones, but I wanted to take a pause and just let you know that the FCC has adopted new rules. In fact, these were the last rules ever to be adopted by the Obama administration. When all of the other uh, rules were pulled when the administration changed. These rules went through. Uh, what it said was that because TTYs are going out of fashion, as wireless providers, wireless service providers make the transition to internet-based wireless services such as Wi-Fi, they have an option to either support TTY or real-time text. What is real-time text? By a show of hands, how many people here know what real-time text is? A lot of you, oh, very educated audience. So basically, it's just communicating, and as you're communicating, the other side is receiving what you're communicating. So as you're, the characters are being typed, the other side is receiving it. And that's how TTYs work as well, except the TTYs work over an antiquated Bordeaux, B-A-U-D-O-T, technology that, um, that forces turn-taking. Whereas with real-time text, both sides can use voice and text simultaneously to each other, and you can use it over regular mainstream networks. Um, it's backward compatible with TTYs. It allows um, access to 911 and access to TRS. And the exciting thing, the incredible exciting thing, is that it's here. So any of you who have the most updated iOS system on your phones or have certain Samsung phones and are using Verizon, AT&T, or T-Mobile, you can now have a, a real-time text conversation with someone else. Um, we have a couple of open proceedings on this. I'm going to skip that slide, but just mention that on April 9th, we are having a roundtable to talk about how real-time text can be used with refreshable Braille. So moving, I'm, and I want to let you know this because I just want to get the word out, spread the word that real-time text is available. So uh, there are more performance objectives um, for people with other physical limitations. For example, you have to provide one mode that does uh, not require fine motor control or simultaneous actions, as well as is operable with limited reach and strength, and have controls that are operable without requiring body contact or close proximity, and that's for people with prosthetic devices. For people with speech disabilities, you also have to provide one mode that doesn't require speech. Finally, there is a performance objectives for people who have limited cognition or need extra time. So you have to provide a mode that doesn't require a response time or allow the response time to be bypassed or adjusted. This was originally written for IVR systems, interactive voice menu systems on telephones. It's probably one of the um, one of the performance objectives that I don't think has been met as successfully as others have been, um, but it also the, we, our rules also require that whatever you are providing should minimize the need for cognitive memory, language, and learning skills by the user, 
and you must provide moving text in at least one static mode at the option of the user. Ian mentioned that um, in Europe, the standard, some of the standards are more specific. They're also more specific if some of you are familiar with Section 508. There are technical standards. If, at the FCC, the commissioners prefer not to be specific for two reasons. First of all, because they don't like to micromanage what the industries are doing. And secondly, because they feel that it's more beneficial to define functionality and to allow flexibility, especially because technologies change so often. So more often than not, from our rules, you're not going to be see very many specifics. There are a couple of exceptions to that. Like we do have technical standards on hearing and compatibility and closed captioning display standards. I mentioned that the CBAA not only requires accessibility and compatibility, it also requires something called usability. Usability means basically that a person has to be able to use the product. Um, they have to have access to documentation, product manuals, instructions, call centers, technical support, wherever it's offered, including websites, um, phone support, in stores, etc. Um, I'm going to go over this next slide really fast just to let you know that those of you who um, are do have to require to have to comply we have rec record keeping obligations and we have found these to be really really helpful um, they they add to the accountability of the law just we don't ask for you to submit reports but we do ask for you to keep records and again you're going to see in this um, in this uh, slide that you have to have information about uh, you have to keep information about your efforts to consult with people with disabilities if a complaint is filed, we're going to ask for that information. So not only do we say we think it's a good idea to consult, you really have to consult with people with disabilities because they're going to be checking up on you later on. Um, and we've had some instances where that occurs. And you also have to keep information, uh, records about the description of the accessibility features and the compatibility of products. And you have to file with us annually contact information and certification of the record keeping. The contact information is really important. We have found that consumers come to us, want to contact a company, and then we have it readily available. We don't have to go searching for it. At the FCC, we have something that has worked absolutely phenomenally. Um, and not everything at the FCC works phenomenally, I can promise you that. Um, but this has really worked well. So when we wrote the CVAA, um, we were very unhappy with the way the enforcement had gone for Section 255 because Section, under two, Section 255, if a person wanted to file a complaint, if they filed an informal complaint and said, this telephone is not accessible to me, more often than, than not, the um, telephone company would say, okay, don't use that one, here's another one. It was a one-off. We didn't want that to happen. We wanted, if somebody files a complaint about a telephone not being accessible or another device not being accessible, we wanted that device to be made accessible. So, and we wanted, we wanted the FCC to have more accountability. Remember, this was before I went into the FCC. So we wanted the FCC to have to do certain things. And so we said, you know what, when people file complaints, oh, the, the, under, this, under 255, you could file a formal complaint to not get a one-off. But a formal complaint was like litigation with discovery and you needed lawyers and there were very few informal compl formal complaints filed. So when we wrote the CVA, we said, Let's require the CVA to respond to all complaints within 180 days with a written order explaining why or why not accessibility was required. When I got into the FCC, the Enforcement Bureau came to us and said, you're crazy. There's no way we can do this within 180 days. We've got to build in a front end procedure to enable some kind of mediation or um, efforts at conciliation um, and, and dispute resolution because there's no way we could do this in 180 days. And we were like, no, we don't really want to do that. We really want accountability. But we said, all right, how about if we have this process? And we built it, and it's called Request for Dispute Assistance. Somebody now comes to us. They can't file a complaint when they first come to us. They have to ask for, a, they have to request dispute assistance under the CVAA. We then have 30 days to work with them and the company to achieve a resolution. The consumer has the right to extend that 30-day period in 30-day increments. The companies do not. And then if the consumer, if they can't reach a, a, a resolution, only after they can't reach a resolution, only then does the complaint go to our enforcement bureau and then they have 180 days to decide it. 
We have had, I'd say, maybe around 70 complaints or requests for dispute res res assistance. We have not had a single one go to the Enforcement Bureau. We have resolved every single one, and some of these are really major that have caused major companies to revamp their entire accessibility systems and produced accessible products that were never produced before. Um, and the sad thing about it is I'm not allowed to tell you which those are, <laughs> which makes me crazy, but it's all confidential. But we won't tell anyone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. I'm only being videotaped. It's like when those people go on TV and say, don't tell anybody. So unfortunately, I can't tell you. But you know, you may want to look around and see what suddenly becomes accessible and say, hmm, I wonder if that went through the SEC process. So I'm now a convert. I think that it's, it really worked perfectly. OK, the next thing I'm going to touch on, and I won't spend too much time on it, are waivers. Um, as you know, we had several waivers for the gaming industry. Um, uh, in 2012, we granted a waiver for uh, two years. The industry, however, asked for eight years. Okay, so we gave two years for three classes of, of types of uh, items, consoles, distribution platforms, and gaming software. In 2015, we extended that for only software for 15 months. And in 2016, again, only software for one year. And then in 2017, one more year. So why did we grant any waivers? Well, because it, you weren't where you are now. The industry wasn't where it is now. There were a lot of accessibility challenges. And we wanted to give the industry a chance to apply the knowledge gained in making advanced communication services, remember, and video programming accessible. Remember all those other slides I showed you? We wanted to give the industry an opportunity to take that practical information and apply it to gaming. And, we, and there is a theory at the, at the commission that we don't want to uh, impede innovation. So we felt we'll give the waivers and allow the industry to work through these various issues um, through, um, uh, through the waiver period. Uh, so what qualifies for waiver? We looked at whether or not the, you can only get a waiver if the product is designed to be used with advanced communication services. Um, and, and what we look at that, we, we try to look at that and, wait, let me just, uh, it's actually a little, a little tricky. So the product has to be, um, it has to be able to be used for ACS, but ACS cannot be a primary or co-primary purpose. That's the key. So. This was difficult because in the beginning, when we first started this, there were, ACS was, I mean, gaming was used for communications purposes, but not, we felt not as much as to reach the primary or co-primary level. And that was the other reason that we were able to grant the waiver. In deciding that, we looked at how ACS features are, func and are advertised and announced and marketed, whether ACS functionality is suggested to consumers as a reason for purchasing, or installing or downloading the game, and then we have a general waiver standard. Is it in the public interest to grant the waiver? Um, we also looked at other factors. Those are the factors that have to be considered. We were also allowed to look at how much the manufacturer considered ACS in its market research. Are the ACS functions designed to be used when the game is not being played outside of, of uh, gaming? But one thing that was very that we made very clear is that even if uh, communication is only being used for gaming, it's covered. So it didn't have to be used for outside purposes. Um, and you know, just to what extent it, it, the game, the uh, communication is being used for the individual to enhance the, the game, that was one of the other things that we looked at. Um, for example, if this was taken away from the game, would the person still be able to play, even play the game? Um, and also, how, to what extent ACS is used in s similar devices or services. Um, let me skip that. Okay, so we, as I said, we, have, we still have one waiver in effect. Um, it's for the class of, and I quote, playable games on any hardware or online platform, including game applications that are built into operating system software. And that's the defined class that's covered. However, we decided not to extend it past this next year. We said, that's it. We're giving this to you, but this is the last year. Why? Because we felt like the landscape had changed. Fortnite is a good example. Um, it's changed significantly, and consumer reliance on the ability to communicate 
during online games has, has grown. And so the need, so the, the scale, if you look at the public interest in granting the waiver versus denying it, it started to change. We also required both in the 2016 waiver and in this year a mid-year progress report from ESA, uh, the Electronic Software Association. We, what did we look at? We looked at things like Microsoft, all of the things that Ian was talking about. We looked at Microsoft Software Development Kit for Xbox One and Windows 10 devices with text-to-speech. Um, for example, Halo Wars. This is when I start getting in trouble. So if I say anything that sounds, why is she talking like this? It's because this is where I start getting into my uncomfortable territory of talking about games and when I should really pass the baton to all of you. But Halo Wars um, 2, I understand, is currently utilizing the accessibility options available through its development kit. Nintendo's smartphone app provides near real-time voice chat functionality. Mojang, am I pronouncing that right? Mm -hmm. Has added a text-to-speech feature for Minecraft. So I mean, those are the kinds of things we looked at. And I didn't do this. I had my staff. Um, we have a, one of the people on our staff is a blind attorney, and he helped me <laughs> with all of this stuff. Um, OK, so um, let me go on. I'm almost done. Uh, so the mid-year waiver report has to look at, has to tell us uh, what efforts and innovations and progress has been achieved. Uh, provide examples of games with successful accessibility solutions, a list of disability organizations that ESA consulted with during the waiver period. Again, you've got to consult, 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 and um, also the efforts to conduct outreach and consultation with members of the community during the waiver period. Actually, so I'm going to stop there and just take, let you know, I, I have a couple of other slides, but I, I've been asked to address a few specific questions, so I wanted to just go over, do I still have time or should I take questions? I still have a couple, okay. So I've been asked to answer just a few case examples of what, what our requirements actually mean. Um, I'm going to just throw out a few of these. So if there are three possible routes to navigate through the menus of a game to the communications functionality, do all three need to be accessible? The answer is it depends. Basically, if the functions are redundant and the goal is just to get to communications accessibility, then you might be able to just do it one way. But if, you're, if, if the three different paths are going to affect the game planning and game playing and that communication, then yes, you'd have to do it all three ways. So if you think about why you would want communication, maybe you're, 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 you're trying to join a team of people that are already playing, or you want to start a team, or you want to just turn on settings to enable a chat. If each of these different paths allow you to do these different functions, and yes, you're going to have to make them all accessible. So it's very hard to answer this as an absolute yes or no, but just think about how the, what the goal is. If the functions are redundant to access the same thing three different ways, it may not be necessary. But if you're going to be creating barriers for the player through certain routes used by the game, it's potentially a problem if you don't provide accessibility all three ways. Next question. Um, if an Xbox-only platform, for example, and I'm not picking on Xbox, but the funny thing is that I, will, I, I want to applaud Xbox, the Xbox developers, for doing what they did. Because what you all did was what Apple did, what, and I was telling somebody this before I began, when it added captioning to cell phones. And it, it enabled us to say that video programming shown on cell, fo cell phones and small devices can have captioning. Once it's done by one, it's kind of achievable by all. And so thank you for doing that because you broke the mold. And so if an Xbox-only platform allows real-time transcription between text and speech, do you need to worry about the CVAA if you're not using Xbox? You need to worry about the CVAA more because of Xbox. Um, it's been done, so it shows that it can be done. Um, so even if the text, even if text-to-speech or speech-to-text -to -te -speech -to features aren't supported by the platform, the software manufacturer may still have to achieve it. It's not, it's not one or the other. It's really what the end result is. The if the requirements um, don't apply to game, the requi just again, I'm reiterating, the requirements don't apply to gameplay um, if, if the interface is unrelated to ACS 
except to the extent, however, that the interface is needed to locate, identify, or operate the ACS feature. Uh, can you offer voice chat for people who are blind and visually impaired and text chat for people who are deaf and hard of hearing? Or do you need a real-time way for two-way two transcription between voice and text? Well, think about the way people who don't need accessibility use these features. Do they need a real-time communication feature? If they do, then the answer is you need to provide a real-time feature. So really what you're doing is just saying to the extent that people who don't need accessibility have access to communications, that is what you have to provide. Uh, let's see. Um, I'm going to give you one more. Um, does a blind person have to be able to navigate through menus to reach the communications functionality? I think we all know the answer to that. Yes. Unless it's not achievable. But we think it's achievable. I think it's achievable. Case by case. That's the other thing. Case by case. We'd have to look at, if we get complaints, we'll just look at individual situations. Just to let you know, as I mentioned, when, I wrote, when we wrote the, the CBAA, those of us who wrote it were not in the FCC, so we created a requirement for a biennial report, which we curse every year now that we're in the FCC. Um, but we do put, put out a, a biennial report if, in case any of you are interested in, uh, in it. It covers the level of compliance by industries, and our next report is coming up this October. Um, we also have, and this is really, really important, we have annual awards by, uh, on, for advancement and accessibility by our chairman, and this has been carried forward now by three different chairmen. I will say that Chairman Pai is very supportive of disability issues. He has let us continue uh, on track and we are making tremendous gains. Um, just in the last year, we increased the amount of requirements for video description by 75%, uh, adopted new rules for volume control on cell phones, and as I mentioned, um, after the election, after he was brought in, we, we adopted the rules on real-time text. So we're very lucky to be able to continue our agenda. And every year we recognize individuals, organizations, researchers, government agencies that develop innovations uh, for accessibility. I really encourage you to keep an eye on these awards. We love to award them to innovators, especially small companies, but we've done big companies as well. I think Microsoft has gotten a couple of awards, AT&T has. And we announce our, uh, the winners at each year's M Enabling Conference, which some of you may be familiar with. It's held right outside the Washington, D.C. area. Um, and the awards uh, are always for the year prior, so we're going to be doing that in June of this year. I also wanted to just mention to you that we have a Disability Advisory Committee. Um, we renew every two years. Renewal will come up next January. If any of you are interested in sitting on that Advisory Committee, we'll be putting out a call for nominations. Uh, we, since this is kind of new to our arena of, of, of uh, the, at the FCC, we encourage you to apply. And uh, it's, a, it's a large group, but they've developed tremendous recommendations that we've carried forward on. They were the ones that really pretty much wrote the rules for real-time text. We followed very much what they had suggested. And here is some contact information for me. So I am done with my presentation and thank you again for the opportunity to speak to you. Are there time for questions? Is there time for questions? Yeah, right. Not, right now. not right now. Okay, I'm going to be around um, at least for a while longer and maybe here during lunch as well as the beginning of the reception later. So thank you again.